There are fewer than 30 men in the world qualified to drive Formula One. A mere half dozen, perhaps, to win. At this moment, I'm inclined to think you're not one of them. Welcome to F1Weekly.com. My name is Clark Rogers. I'm the host of the program. I'll be joined by Nasser Hamid, my co-host. This is podcast number 996, June 12th, 2023, Nasser. Thank you, sir. I say Canadian Grand Prix may be going platters. Blessed by the Italian Jesus, Scuderia Ferrari prances to victory at Le Mans. Sushi meets hot dog. We shall explain. Gladly. Back to you, Chief. Thank you, Nasser. On today's program, Ferrari win. Yes, Ferrari have won the Le Mans, the 24 Heures du Mans. Absolutely marvelous. Audi have their eyes on this man called Fernando. McLaren makes a deal with Red Bull and Alpine gets a whole lot of free beer. And this week's interview, IndyCar driver Matteo Nanini and IMSA team owner Faisal Ahmad Nass will have all the details and the correct pronunciations. And don't forget, we need your contributions to keep this program on the air. Just click on the Support F1 Weekly tab on the front page. You know you'll want to. Nass, welcome to the studio. What a race. France looked absolutely wonderful. Even Chip Ganassi was basting in the sun. Yes, sir. Ferrari winning, whether you like them or not, is very good for the sport. So it was a fantastic race, lots of rain, lots of uh, cautions. What do you expect when NASCAR shows up? JB was there, so it was a great excitement. I have watched a lot of it, obviously not the 24 hours, but I watched a lot of the race and really, really enjoyed it. And it's just uh, my friend Olivier Mayonu, who works for Nicola Todd, wrote to me last year that you got to be at this race, uh, it's 100 years but uh, because of job situation and I have a trip coming up or in a week or so anyway, I had no choice but to miss the 100 Le Mans. And uh, great event, really enjoyed it. And we'll talk uh, more on this a little bit later. But I hear, Mr. Rogers, that there's a 60% chance of rain in Montreal. So, and we already have a case of smoke gaps in your eyes. They say where there is smoke, there is fire, and north of, of the border we have some fiery action going on. And the powers that be are saying, show will go on. We have already lost one race at Emola due to Mother Nature. Let's hope for, I can see clearly now, the smoke is gone. Do you have any concerns about the race north of the border because of now rain and fire? Well, I think the fire is okay. We certainly do need the rain in North America. So that's good news. Whether there's an F1 race, I'm not sure, but I'm pretty sure everything I've looked at says we will be racing and there's a little boogity boogity in there as well. And you know, quite a few drivers um, have won their first race here. I'm wondering, maybe it could be the first win for Aston Martin in Formula One. You mean El Machismo at the top of the spear? Well, Nigel Mansell used to say it would give him half a second of oomph when he raced at Brands Hatch and Silverstone. But I think local boy Lance Stroll will need about a second and a half over Machismo, which is impossible uh, to give Aston Martin their first win. But you never know. I mean, what could be a better story? A Canadian driver who came from humble beginnings, uh, worked hard all his life, now working for daddy, give the team their first win. It could be a fantastic story. 
What say you? Oh, I like the other story better. Fernando wins, and P2 is LCH, P3, Lance Stroll. It'll be exciting because it will be the two old men of the sea and the young whippersnapper. I'm telling you, there's a lot of possibilities in Canada. We'll see what happens. But uh, and don't forget, a shoe could interrupt everything. So you never know. Oh, the shoe and Montreal. And why don't you just complete that top five by saying Checo fourth and Max fifth? We could do that. Max, you know, he's going to start relaxing a lot more. Max, you know, even if he relaxes, um, he's still going to be lethal. Just like Kimi Raikkonen on a slow day, he was very quick. And that's what JB said about somebody who happened to win his first race in Canada many moons ago. So who do you think is going to win after um, Alonso takes the checkered flag first? You know, it's up in the air. It could be anybody. But let's let's face it. After the big Ferrari win at Le Mans, certainly Leclerc needs to step it up a little bit after those drivers did such a great job at Le Mans. It was, I, I mean, I enjoyed watching all of it. It's time for Ferrari, the F1 team, to look as good as the Le Mans team. Yes, and you know, speaking of Charles Leclerc, uh, his helmet, case of going, going, gone, uh, which he was wearing at this year's Monaco Grand Prix, has been auctioned off by Sotheby's for only 306,000 British pounds, which is like about maybe three hundred thirty, three hundred forty thousand dollars $340,000. And it's a new helmet record. All proceeds will go to the area affected by recent flooding in Italy, which led to the cancellation of the race at Imola. Now, I may have some, missed something on the late breaking news. You mentioned at the top of the show, uh, McLaren going Red Bull. Is that a done deal? Signed, seal, delivered? Of course not, Nasser. You know how it is. I investigate. I get some results. Some are fake. Some are authentic. But the Ford concept came back. And you know, Zach Brown, if there's something fast and stinky, he's all over it. So, I don't know. Fast and stinky? <laughs> yes, that's how I put it all together really quickly for a quick visual. Yes, uh, well, based on performance, uh, you are, as always, cor El Correcto. Now, moving on to more motor racing news, we have a score here. Spa 1, South Africa 0. And that's not football score, folks. That's F1 score. Belgian Grand Prix is the beneficiary of South Africa's close relations with Russia. According to published reports, the Formula One Supremo, they have decided not to race at Kailami in 2024 for political correctness. Apparently, a nation of South Africa has shipped some ammunition to Russia. And this has opened the door for Spa to be on the schedule next season. Are you happy? I am very happy. That is disgusting and wrong to be supporting Russia when they are the aggressor. Well, I'm very happy Spa is back. Losing Spa, I mean, I cannot even... This would be like removing New York Yankees from NBA, uh, Major League Baseball or kicking out uh, Green Bay Packers from NFL just because a team in Kinshasa or, you know, Burkina Faso has paid you know, $50 million to NFL or whatever the organization is, if you know what I mean. Well, don't knock Burkina Faso. My brother says it's a marvelous little place to go visit, and the dollar goes a long way. And on the other hand, for me, to lose spa would be losing my left testicle. Oh boy, we're going deep here, so I'll move on. Okay, Bridgestone may be back. Hints and allegation are that Pirelli may have competition when FIA tire contract comes up for renewal in 2025. Bridgestone is reported to be evaluating a comeback, while Bibendum, aka Michelin, has stated that they are not interested in show where somebody is telling them how to bear tires. Firestone is owned by Bridgestone, and I don't think they will also try to make a bid, as parent company may not like double dipping into the same sauce. But I would like to see Goodyear try to make a run for it. You remember how successful they were back in the day? I do. Goodyear, Michelin. And it's funny because, well, if you watched the Le Mans 
24 heures du monde. It was exciting, and there was a lot of Michelins going around. But the best part is some people were running good years. We had good year. We had Michelin. We even had the good year blimp. It was a happy family of competition. And over 300,000 people led the race. And, you know, some years ago I went there and uh, I was having a huge problem getting into the track because there was so much traffic. So I said, I'll just drive a few miles away and uh, park my car at some hotel. So some nice lady at the hotel, she said to me, yes, you can park here. A lot of people are, you know, here for the race from everywhere. And she said, uh, just take the train. It will take you to the track. I figured... You know, it's going to stop me somewhere near the track. So I asked her, how long will be the walk to get to the track? She says, no, it will take you to the track. And I really did not understand her. So I take the train and the train goes inside the track. You know, there's a station right where the Dunlop Bridge is. Now, fast forward seven, eight years, I'm taking a tram, uh, the same tram, and there's an old gentleman sitting next to me. He turns out to be from New Zealand. And he asked me, mate, how long is the <laughs> walk to the track from the station? I says, it's going to take you inside the track. And, and he did not believe just like me. I said, wait till you get there. That is very, very cool. And uh, so I will try to go there. And they have a fantastic museum there. That's very good. So it's all good. Yeah, there was a lot of uh, American involvement. So this, this um, race is also getting a lot of uh, traction here, So which is all good. Motorsports is like music. It brings people, not like politics and ideology, which divide. Hence our interest in military race. Any final word on the results, sir? We will have more on that later, but anything you want to say? I thought the whole thing was awesome. And what was really impressive, the AOC, you know, and they could tell you what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. They encouraged Garage 56 to use their nascar style pit stops so they didn't have built-in pneumatic jacks in the car like the other teams they had to use floor jacks just like they do in nascar and aoc wanted them to do that they wanted to see the nascar funky show so i thought that was great uh they had a little bit of bad luck they lost some time changing brakes they had a little bit of gearbox issue but they finished they were elegant they didn't crash and burn and have to replace the whole car like some teams so i was very proud of my boys now the question is did they have to beat up on the car with a baseball bat during any of the 24 hours that's what was amazing jensen button rockefeller and jimmy johnson and you know i thought jimmy johnson you know he's sort of attracted to walls and has hit them many many times what a clean race for those three guys outstanding no bats, no helicopter tape, no tire fire. And no jet dryer, even though there was rain? No jet dryer. The rain was, it, it was a petite rain, just to remind everybody that we're here to go racing. There you go. Very good. Okay, sir, now moving on to tracking tally numbers. The Spanish Grand Prix averaged 0.58, which means 1.04 million viewers on ESPN's live coverage. NTT IndyCar Series on the new downtown Detroit Grand Prix course averaged 0.65, which is 1.047 on NBC, the Peacock Network. Sunday's rain-affected Winston Cup race averaged 1.27, which is 2.16 million on Fox Sports 1. So NASCAR remains the big um, 800-pound gorilla on the American uh, racing landscape. Now, the interesting uh, last weekend's 18 to 49 age demographic numbers, not including streaming, had F1 up front with 453,000 viewers, followed by NASCAR 413 and IndyCar 177,000. Any com comments on these uh, numbers? No, not surprising. You know, we're in America. I'm not sure why NASCAR is so dominant because i try to watch it man but man it just after a while you just shake your head and you go back and clean your toilet or something i'm really happy i think those are good numbers for indycar and watch the water go in left well we're in america it goes right gracias okay that's good very good and um you know the reason nascar is popular many reasons first of all is grassroots americana racing is 
circle tracks, small, you know, quarter mile, whatever. And if you look at just in California, there is a track everywhere, you know, Watsonville, Sanger, Fresno, Modesto. So that's why it's so popular. And I have to say, especially when the Indy car split happened, and probably before that, and of course since then, NASCAR has done a tremendous job of taking care of number one. For them, number one is their fans. Okay, I remember some years ago, Nigel Robock came to Daytona 500. He was invited and he wrote Motorsport or Autosport. I think it was Motorsport he was writing. And he spent a whole weekend there or a week. And then he put a picture there and it was like a pan shot and it says fan zone. And, he, and the caption of the photo was something you will never see in Formula One. So, you know, I mean, they have a race, I think, Dover, Delaware, which even today you can get a $1 hot dog. So they have done a tremendous job. Formula One, as much as I like Formula One, look how they have treated the fans. People like you and me, who, who have, we have followed all our lives Formula One. What do we get now? A $1,000 ticket for Grandstand? Oh, that's beautiful. And a $20 hot dog. Oh, yes. And don't forget the $9 Diet Coke. That's just, uh, I mean, incredible. But, you know, it's follow the money. That's for smart people, too. Okay, sir. Now, Me Too Part 2. I don't know if you've read about this. In the post-race live TV coverage of the Spanish Grand Prix, Sky Sports Italia commentator, Senor Matteo Bobby and ex-GP2 champion Davide Valsecchi made inappropriate and sexist jokes in front of their female colleague, who is a hot-looking chica, Federica Massolin, which she did not like as well. So they have been grounded for the Canadian Grand Prix. And, but the lady has come out in their defense that they are, you know, it was a joke, but they're not really like this. But this day and age, you know, you just have to be too careful, I guess. And Martin Brundle also getting heat for referring to Gon Yu Cho as Chinaman. So if you ever refer to uh, George Russell as an Englishman, you may offend somebody. So keep an eye on those digital slings and arrows. You know, we're always on top of that here at F1 Weekly, NAS. Remember when Martin Brundle got some heat for calling some corner workers bikies, and that was also in Montreal. Okay, sir, shall we do our first interview? We have two for our listeners today. Absolutely. Outstanding stuff, by the way. Very informative. NAS, keep up the good work. The check is in the mail. Please tell us all about it. Yes, sir. The first interview is with my homeboy, Mr. Fassel Ahmed. Him and I connected many years ago through Facebook. In those days, uh, he was racing a little Honda Civic in uh, SCCA competition. And today he owns a racing team. It's called Tay's Racing Team. And they are based out of Detroit. The car is a Mercedes AMG, beautiful dark green color. And they made their debut. They wanted to do this thing right. So they missed Sebring, made their debut at home race in Detroit. And Moa was there. And they did a very good job and finished third in their debut race. So hopefully they will be doing more races and do a full uh, season next year. So I would like to thank Mr. Fessel for his time and his friendship. And I look forward to seeing his team in action soon again. So please enjoy this conversation. Mr. Fessel, Emma, thank you for joining F1 Weekly. How are you today and what's shaking and baking in Detroit? A fantastic day. Year. weather was great weekend was wonderful how are you today i am doing very good thank you and it was very nice meeting you in detroit and first of all congratulations on a great debut by your team how exciting was that for you was it pre-planned or a pleasant surprise in this level of uh, motorsport and competition it, it's always uh, you can never be guaranteed this so obviously it was a surprise or a little bit of pleasant surprise but we definitely were were prepared and it wasn't uh, by luck it was a lot of hard work uh, prior to the event to get ourselves in the position that we wanted to be in okay and it's definitely good to see a homeboy in racing owning a team uh, let's hear your story about how you develop passion for motorsports and how long have you been interested i've been interested in motorsports uh, my entire life some of my family members uh, cousins and whatnot have been in racing in the subcon since i can remember since i was a little kid and my first experience was was a little Suzuki Swift uh, rally car they had built, and I was in. I remember visiting Karachi and uh, taking me for a ride in that thing. And actually, that was the first car I ever drove. I believe I was 10 years old or something like that, and uh, I was hooked. 
Great. And we connected on Facebook when you were racing Honda Civics in SCCA. Uh, how long did you race yourself and any exciting uh, moments or highlights of your driving career you can share with us? Yeah, you know, I think we met, we were running in the NASA uh, championship uh, in those days. Uh, we had a pair of Honda Civics running in performance touring. Our goal, my partner Brian and I, I was still my partner. Our goal was always to try to win the national championship. It started in 2009, and, and by 2011, we'd accomplished that goal. So for us, I think the highlights there were, you know, we pretty much had track records in our class at every track we visited. Even from that amateur level, our thinking was always, you know, to be prepared to, to approach the events as if we were a professional team, and uh, uh, we've translated that into the next level here. Uh, your team has a very interesting uh, name, Taze Racing. Will you please tell our listeners a background to this name? Sure. Uh, when, we were, when we first had the idea to IMSA, we knew we wanted a recognizable brand that we could uh, rally behind because our vision is to do more than just GS. So with that, we wanted a cool-sounding name, and, and I wanted something that harkened back to uh, my background. So the word Taze as you know, means fast, and so in our language, and so we uh, kind of phonetically spelled it out and came up with today's competition, and and uh, here we are. Yeah, that's very good. Now, like you said, you did a lot of um, preparation for it, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of work goes on in setting up a team like you have in, uh, I believe it's in GT4 competition. Uh, tell us what is required to do something, a project like this, apart from a lot of money which racing takes. Yeah, well, at the IMSA Michelin Pilot Challenge level, which I would say is one of the most competitively uh, challenged championships in this category anywhere, it, you, you can't, you have to have the right team and crew around you. And so we really uh, spent a lot of time carefully choosing the team and every member of that team. So we were, we were very lucky and blessed that we created almost an all-star lineup from the drivers down to the fireman uh, everyone was on the same program and the same page and uh, that's really what it what it took you know we we always had a vision of the category and we saw a a hole that uh, there wasn't really a lot of driver development or ladder system kind of in place and that's really what we strive to create here and dt4 being that that uh, entry rung, that middle rung, there's room above and there's room below. And uh, inshallah, that's the, the, the trick is we will continue to build that ladder out and be able to ultimately take drivers from karting and all the way up to prototypes and, and have a place for them to grow and, and really learn everything it takes to be a, a professional race car driver. And what is the youngest age a driver can race in this series? Uh, I believe IMSA, I'd have to double check, but uh, I would say they can be under 16. I know there are some, some uh, youngsters driving around, but uh, I'm not 100% sure. No, oh, that's very interesting. And speaking of drivers, you have a Can-Am driver lineup. Can you tell us a little bit about your drivers, please? Uh, sure. We have uh, Mark Miller, who hails from Holland, Michigan. He's a seasoned veteran. He has won races in Michelin Pilot Challenge in the... GT4 category. He was a factory driver for Dodge. I believe twice at Le Mans. He's competed at every prestigious sports car event you can think of. And he's a great asset to our team. Currently, he's driving uh, in the GT3 category in WeatherTech as well. And then Michael DeMeo, who is a youngster coming in. He's won the uh, Touring Car Championship in the past. He's raced a few uh, GT3 races as well. And uh, we really feel like he is a big talent that is up and coming and, and uh, will surprise many people. So we're very, very happy with, uh, with our lineup. And can you introduce your crew chief to us also, please? So our crew chief is uh, Kelly Brown, who comes from years and years in motorsports, specifically with AMG GT4 uh, programs. He's uh, been super successful. Car chief is a man named Michael Kahn. Uh, he has an organization called MC Squared, uh, where they've been leaning on them a little bit for the infrastructure that we need as we build ours up. And finally, to round out the team, we have uh, Kelly Grant, uh, Kelly Grant, sorry, Grant, uh, who 
who is our chief engineer and strategist. And again, he has been engineering the AMG GT4 platform uh, since almost before it was homologated by the FIA. It comes from championship winning programs, and uh, it was a bit of a bit of a coup on our part to be able to land such talent for our team. But I think he believes in our vision for the long term and what we want to take this competition. And so. Uh, we're very lucky to have him aboard. Great. Um, you are racing an AMG Mercedes. Did you look at other brands before uh, settling on Mercedes? Yeah, we evaluated every uh, platform uh, in the category, and we were very, very happy with the AMG platform for a number of reasons. Uh, first and foremost, they're a pleasure to work with. Their support is uh, second to none. They're at every race that we're at. They, they, and the engineers are very available. Uh, but in terms of the platform itself, what we liked about it is we feel out of all the other GT4 cars, it's the furthest from the street car. It's the most race car. So from the transmission to the suspension to everything else about the way that car is built, it is furthest away from the street car. And we feel that's an asset given that our goals and aspirations are to move into the uh, GT3 program here as soon as we can. Uh, we felt like it was important that we well, with a manufacturer that had a GT3 program as well, so that it wouldn't be um, a brand new learning curve when we make the jump. Now, here is the important question: Since you are going AMG, will that result in Toto Wolf inviting you to Vegas for the Grand Prix? <laughs> I don't know that we're on his radar just yet. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I hope you appear on his radar soon. Great. Okay. Now your car. <laughs> I saw your car, and um, it has a beautiful paint scheme, Golden Eagle on dark green body. Question is, is this British racing green or Pakistan racing green? Well, you know, for, for me, it's, it's Pakistan, Zindabad, but uh, I think for us, it's a stunning, stunning combination. And honestly, as much as I wanted the car to be green, that wasn't the only reason. You know, we looked at the paddock, again, coming back to branding and and creating a, a recognizable product, there weren't any other green cars like this. And, you know, if you look at uh, blue and yellow, you automatically associate that with Turner. You know, we see a red uh, plaid car that's immediately at Reza's FAF uh, with their Porsche program. So we thought, you know, this is a whole, it worked out for me because it, it harkens back to our heritage. But uh, uh, that's kind of where we landed on it. No, it's beautiful and it looks very, very impressive. Okay, where will your team be racing rest of the season? Uh, you know, that's a uh, that's a very good question. We we had a bit of a setback in the beginning. Uh, our car was delayed a bit by no fault of AMG, just given the the nature of the world that we were living in at the time. And so our season wasn't. Uh, we weren't able to debut in, De in Daytona as expected. So we've had a bit of a broken season, and we also wanted to make sure we had all the all the parts and pieces that we wanted for our team and for our infrastructure in place before we really hit it. We're looking at Toronto as our next uh, IMSA race. We are working on the logistics of that right now. Uh, we will be hitting a few more races this year. Uh, as soon as I can confirm them, I will you'll be the first uh, first to know. And we're looking forward to a full 24 season. Oh, I, I will appreciate that. And at some stage, whether it's this year or next year, do you plan to get behind the wheel also? You know, I'd really love to. Um, <laughs> it, it'd be great to get back behind the wheel. I don't know if I'm uh, quite fit or fast enough to race with these guys in, in uh, Pilot Challenge, but I'll find a place for myself somewhere. <laughs> okay. As we all know, racing cannot be done on Kmart Blue Light Special Budget. Can you give us an idea of how much it costs to do a season with one car in GT4 and GT3, which, you know, the GT3 is very popular worldwide now? To run a quality program in the GT4 category, IMSA, uh, I'm into seven-figure endeavor. A GT3 is some, some multiple of that. Wow. Very, very impressive, I have to say. Now, do you plan to add a second car later this year or for next season? Yeah, we actually uh, just got word that our second GT4 uh, is ready, and wow. uh, so we're working on getting that uh, transported here to the States. So. Okay, now, we all know Mercedes' um, Formula 1 program is based in England, both for engine and uh, chassis. Uh, what are they manufacturing these AMG cars in Germany or somewhere else? 
Uh, no, they're, they're manufactured at the AMG facility in Afrobach in Germany. Oh, that's good. Have you ever visited that uh, facility or the Mercedes Museum? You know, I haven't had the pleasure yet. I'm, it's on my bucket list to do. Hopefully, uh, we can get through the season and I can uh, do that in the off-season. Yeah, I've been to the Mercedes Museum in Stuttgart. It is very, very impressive. Okay, now, uh, you recently sponsored a karting team in Dubai. Can you tell us about that program and if that is con- will continue with your team? Yeah, absolutely. So, even from our from back when we were doing our, our NASA racing under the uh, Fox Sound Express banner, that was the name of our team, uh, the goal was to help raise awareness for motorsports in Pakistan. Uh, you know, my long-term dream is to to do some sort of to build some sort of infrastructure there, so that there is a path for the talent that we have in the country to to find their way up. And so, along those lines, as we were putting phase together, we've been uh, blessed to be introduced to some some really great young young drivers coming through. Uh, I believe you know one in um, Ahmed. Uh, right. who's been racing in AD NXT. So we're happy to support his endeavors. And through him, we met uh, some people over at the Omni Karting facility in, uh, in Karachi mm-hmm. who expressed interest to compete uh, as Team Pakistan in the, the World Karting Championship in Dubai or, or, or that, that event in Dubai. Of course, we, we were thrilled. Uh, we were happy to support them to not only with monetary resources, but also with our strategy and with our infrastructure here. Uh, I would absolutely love to continue helping Team Pakistan compete in these national, in the international events and, and raise the country's name in those ways, whether it's in karting or whether it's the FIA Challenge, the FIA Games. These are things that are definitely on my list of, of uh, hot items I'd like to tackle. Yeah, well, I wish you all the best, and if I can be of any assistance, uh, you know how to reach me. Of course. Okay, now, uh, what are the long-term plans for your team? Um, GTP, Le Mans, IndyCars, wh- where do you see your team in five to eight years? Well, right now, our, our long-term goals, as we've said, uh, you know, make an attempt. We'd love to, really, you know, uh, we haven't looked quite a, a mountain to climb as it, as it is, is the limit if we build the program the way we plant in the 24 hours of Daytona uh, at victory at some point uh, we focused at, on sports production based sports mounted decline we'll see where it takes us okay great thank you so much for your time and I look forward to see, seeing you soon again at the races Fassel thanks for joining f1weekly.com Master I think it's time for a break so we'll be back after these brief messages. I am Christian Rasmussen from Denmark, and you are listening to F1 Weekly. Welcome back to F1Weekly.com. Clark Rogers here, your host. In now, as we spin the globe and go around the world with Motorsports Mondial, with the king, the Swami himself, Nasser Hamid. Thank you, sir. And the globe is going to take a rest in your Shangri-La, Le Mans, France. One of the great races of all time celebrated 100 years of success past weekend. 50 years ago, Italian cowboy Arturo Mazzario put the prancing horse on pole for the French classic. This year, Antonio Fuoco did another wonderful Italian job by putting his Ferrari on pole. Sharing the front row with him was Italian Jesus, Antonio Giovinazzi. Sebastian Buemi enjoyed Oh What a Feeling by qualifying his third. third. Penske Porsche of cousin Felipe Nasser qualified fourth. Rain and Rex for order of the day and night, the Toyota of Kobayashi of XF1 fame took one hit to the body and was out, which I think was a big shame. Fans were looking forward to a great battle to the end between the leading Ferrari and the remaining Toyota. Their Japanese driver Ryo Hirakawa was supposed to do a double stint and the team told him to go maximum attack. Not sure if the press pressure got to him, but he spun and, to borrow a phrase from commentator, gave Ferrari team a free kick. Scuderia Ferrari almost scored an own goal on the final pit stop. They got the beautiful Dallara Bill 499P going again, and that was all she wrote. The question I have, was Rio the fastest of their driver to be given a double stint leading to the finish? Or was this a italics from Tokyo? 
With Sebastian Buemi and Brendan Hartley also on the payroll and in the same team, in the same car I should say, I have my miso doubts. Congratulations and lost lots of Astis Pomanti to Ferrari and their drivers for winning the race of the century as it was promoted. And Toyota drivers and team, they were very nice. They also congratulated the team, Ferrari team. So that was nice to see. The winning drivers are Alessandro Pierguidi, 39-year-old who once raced for Team Italia in Avon GP. James Collado from England, he had a very impressive rookie season in GP2. Unfortunately, he did not make it to Formula 1, but the engine did. Sorry, Mr. Clark. Okay, the third member of the crew was a man who can walk on Eau Rouge, Signor Antonio Giovinazzi. Once upon a time, he raced in Formula 1 with Sauber. They completed 342 laps of the Le Mans Sartre circuit. Rio kept flowing after a spin, and he brought a car home second. Sebastian Buemi and Brendan Hartley, as I mentioned, are his teammates. The best part was three different manufacturers in top three, with Cadillac of Earl Bamber, Alex Ling, and Richard Westbrook in third, ahead of another El Dorado of local garçon Sebastian Bordet, Dutch driver Renga van der Zande, and Kiwi IndyCar superstar Scott Dixon. Completing the top five was the second Ferrari of Paisan Antonio Fuoco, who had qualified on pole, Espanol Miguel Molina, and Dane Nicholas Nielsen. And Mr. Rogers, this race is very dear to me, just like the Brands Hatch Formula 1 circuit, because it was the first ever Grand Prix circuit I ever went to. On a personal note, it was the 50th running of Le Mans in 1973, and radio commentary on BBC World Service by a chap named Robin Richards, which I vividly remember, that got me hooked on motor racing. When the cars went by, he did not give names of the driver, but instead said, Matra Ferrari Matra. And as soon as I heard the sound of those V12s, a little tweety bird in my mind said, There is nothing else in this world for you, boy. And the birdie num num was damn right. It's been a party since then. Now, I know you were wishing for Peugeot to win the race, but uh, they only had one uh, Peugeot in the top 10. It's a beautiful looking car, just like the Ferrari. Were you disappointed in, in your French team's performance, sir? A little bit. I mean, they, they led for a little while, I think in the eighth hour, but of course ran into some issues. Drivers made mistakes, the American driver. But other, other than that, the car is great. It's new. I think we'll see how they do in the, in the season. And I'm hoping they do better once we get in the WEC World Endurance Championship and we get to Monza. But very exciting. I watched, I have to admit, probably 18 hours of Le Mans because I just wanted to get it all in. The 100th one, I was glad to be alive on the 100th one. And it was fun. Yeah, and the, the Peugeot was at Seabrig also. It's a very bold design, beautiful design. And Jean-Eric One is one of their drivers, right? Correct. Okay, you know, normally for races, they do points to ponder, but this was Le Mans, so we're going to do Le Point to ponder. First race in 1923 was won by André Lagache and René Lenard in a Chena Walker. I hope I got the names correct. Winner in 1932 was Luigi Canetti. Later, at the request of Enzo, he became Ferrari importer for the United States and later on became the first, I believe he's the first U.S. citizen or American driver to win Le Mans, which he did later on also for the second time. One of the greats of Grand Prix racing, Tazio Novolari, won in 1933 driving Alfa Romeo. In 1950, I did not know this, but, you know, I was doing some research and came across this and did some cross-checking also because it was hard to believe. In 1950, a chap by the name of Eddie Hall drove his Bentley solo for 24 hours and did not even get out of the car during pit stops, and he finished eight. And amazingly, Mr. Rogers, this car is now on display at the Res Museum, which is here in Florida in a town called Naples. And I believe Dan Gurney's 67 Belgian Grand Prix winning Eagle is also nesting there. And now that my total retirement days are just a week away, I will definitely make a run to Naples, which I have tried um, a few months ago, but I was going to go with a friend of mine and things did not work out. But I'll definitely go there this year and 
get some photos. 1955, biggest tragedy in motorsports. Your dad was at this event, as I remember you telling me. You are correct. My father was there in 1955. I even have some pictures of the paddock. It's very exciting. Did you ever talk to him about the accident? I did. And he said it was just unbelievable. And it just sucked all the joy out of the air. Now, first American world champion uh, in 1961, Phil Hill had won at Le Mans in 1958 with Belgian driver Olivier Chandebien in a Ferrari. Carol Shelby and Roy Salvadori won the race in 1959 for Aston Martin. 1966 famous Ford versus Ferrari results in four in a row in favor of the Blue Oval. 1967 beginning of spring champagne after Dan Gurney and A.J. Ford won the race and Dan Gurney started that tradition which is still very strong. I'm surprised uh, some lobby has not come out against, they've come out against tobacco and alcohol, but the uh, champagne spring still goes on. Sooner or later, somebody's going to speak up against that also. Okay, sir. 1969, Jackie Ix, due to safety concerns, he walks up to, to his car instead of running and jumping into it, which was the case up until 1969. And then he goes on to win the race with his co-driver, Jackie Oliver, and Pleased to say we have done extensive, extended interviews with both these gents. Moving on, modern day machete maestro Dr. Helmut Marco was the winner at Le Mans in 1971 with Heis van Lennep in a Porsche. And we met Mr. Heis van Lennep in a, uh, at Laguna Seca some years ago. Do you remember that? Of course. I mean, I pronounce it Gis van Lennep, but that was a great conversation. Super nice guy. And let's not forget, he held... That lap record with his Porsche for many, many years. It was only broken maybe like 10 years ago. You remember that? Oh, absolutely. 76. All from Holland, right? I'm with yeah. F1Weekly.com. We couldn't believe you were here. Very, very nice yeah. to see you. But we were a late entry. It's my car, you know. It's... You know, we do a F1 Weekly podcast, and we have a few questions for you, please. Yes, please. You drove the 917 at uh, Le Mans, right? Yeah, 1971 with Helmut Marko. And Helmut Marko. And you won that race, right? And I won that race with a Porsche 917 5 litre, and we still hold the record. I know. 5,335 kilometers. Yeah, I know it all. 222.3 kilometers average. How was it driving on the Mulsanne straight, the old fast Mulsanne in that car? Oh, marvelous, because uh, then we had the rest. But it did 350 kilometers an hour. The short tail one, our car. The long tail was 370, we did 350. But we had one fast flat out corner, so you have to be very precise steering in, in the fast corner there. But there was only one corner, it was flat out. That is true. And you know what I really remember from that conversation is how pissed off he was with uh, Frank Williams and because he had given Frank William a first point for his team in Formula One. That's the way these, you know, things go. And he's not the only F F1 driver we have spoken to who had bitterness against ex-team owners. Okay, sir. Mazda became first Japanese manufacturer to win the French Classic in 1991 with Johnny Herbert, Falker Weidler, and Bertrand Gasho which beckons the question sponsored by London Cabby Association. Where have we heard this name before? I wonder if he ever got a nice uh, Christmas uh, present from Michael Schumacher at the end of the 1991 season. You know the classic thing about him, once he got out of the jail, and this was in Motorsport magazine, I think it was the Belgian Grand Prix at some European race where Eddie Jordan invited him and his girlfriend to come and have drinks or lunch with the team. So he went there and later, according to him, Eddie Jordan sent him an invoice for the drinks and, and, and uh, whatever he had. So, yeah. So be careful if Eddie Jordan invites you to some uh, shindig. Okay, sir. Tom Christensen becomes the Great Dane of Le Mans with his record-setting ninth win in 2013. Interestingly, before this year's race, he had the same number of wins at Le Mans as Ferrari and leading the pack in victories at Le Mans as you can imagine is Porsche with 19 so which is very impressive for the fatherland. Oh here is my favorite Kobayashi going in circles sushi meets hot dog. Ex Toyota and Sauber F4 racer will race at Indianapolis for Michael Jordan and Denny Hamlin's own team. 
not surprisingly they run a Toyota. And uh, what do you make of this, sir? They're going to run it. I, I haven't heard about this. What are they? They're running at the Indianapolis 500? No, 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 no. The Toyota, uh, the NASCAR race, uh, I think it's at the... Oh, thank you. I started going, what? That's nice. I think that's terrific. You know, you get out a little bit. That's nice. Kobayashi, I think it's perfect. NASCAR, Kobayashi likes America. He's had the hot dog. He's ready to go. Yeah, and when he comes here, he will say, oh, more Toyotas here than Japan. (laughs) <laughs> which would, would not surprise me, but to be honest with you. But uh, no, this is, you know, this fusion of global motorsports, now the rules are pretty much the same. And this, this is very good, you know. I remember uh, some years ago, uh, the American sports car team and the uh, Japanese GT series, they were trying to, you know, they were all trying to have the same engine rules so the cars can come over and cars from here can go there. So I think this is all very good. Okay, sir, now it's time for some Swedish Rhapsody. Yeah, and when he comes here, he will say, oh, more Toyotas here than Japan, <laughs> which would, would not surprise me, but to be honest with you. But uh, no, this is, you know, this fusion of global motorsports, now the rules are pretty much the same. And this, this is very good, you know. I remember uh, some years ago, uh, the American sports car team and the uh, Japanese GT series, they were trying to, you know, they were all trying to have the same engine rules so the cars can come over and cars from here can do- go there. So I think this is all very good. Okay, sir, now it's time for some Swedish Rhapsody. With that, we come to fight in the Fiat family. Man, this is just uh, one of those things. Why am I not surprised? What can bring a family closer more? than billions and billions of dollars. Let's call this piece the Fiat Fiasco. An inheritance case is going on in Italy involving the involving the Agnelli family, the founding father of Fiat Empire. Chairman of Stellantis and Ferrari, Mr. John Alcan, against his mother, Margherita Agnelli, who is the daughter of the late Gianni Agnelli. She has been waging a legal battle for more than a de- decade, claiming that provisions were only made for for her three children from her first marriage, and John is one of them. She has five more children from her second marriage. And this is a long, long story. Uh, To read the full story, please visit fortune.com under the heading, An Italian Code Just Weighed In on a Ferrari Family Drama Pitting the Car Company's Chairman Against His Mother. And it's available online also. Speaking of money, a chap by the name of Bernard Ecclestone has some issues. Millions and millions. Ex-Formula One Supremo Bernie Ecclestone on Tuesday formally pleaded not guilty to a fraud charge over his alleged failure to declare millions of dollars held in a trust in Singapore to British government. He faced his trial in November following a worldwide investigation by Britain's tax office into his finances. Prosecutors allege he failed to declare a trust in Singapore with a bank account containing around $650 million when he was asked about any trusts abroad that he was involved in. Bernie told UK authorities he had set up only a single trust in favor of his three daughters and that he was not the settler or nor beneficiary of any trust in or outside the UK. Prosecutors say he acted dishonestly and intended to make a gain from the claims. But wait, there's more. This, yeah, this never stops. According to a website, thejudge13.com, Max has tax issues also. Allegations of $200 million euros tax are vehemently denied by his manager, Raymond Fermulen. According to him, Max is in full compliance with tax regulations. According to him, Verstappen pays taxes on his sporting performance. Now, this is interesting. He pays taxes on his sporting performances in the Netherlands as well as on the income he generates during race weekend in Sanford. They maintain that taxes are duly paid in other countries where Verstappen generates income. Sounds like the Dutch tax man wants his cut on income earned outside. I am not a graduate of IRS Academy. So I will not uh, comment on this. Sounds like the Dutch tax man wants his cut on income earned outside Netherlands. I am not a graduate of IRS Academy, so I will not comment on this, but I will say, 
Miss Leona Hensley, please pick up the white courtesy phone. And Mr. Roger, my understanding is if a U.S. citizen is working outside the United States, he still has to pay American taxes also. Is that correct? You're asking the wrong guy. I believe that if you work six months or less outside of the country, Yes, you do have to pay taxes in this country, but not in that country. Okay, I don't know how this thing works. Anyway, as they say, money, problems if you have it, problems if you don't have it. So what will little people do, Mr. Rogers? They will have their cake and eat it too, while watching Formula One Grand Prix motor racing. Do you have any comments on these uh, people with their tax issues? I find it a little bizarre. I think the fiat empire thing is really super bizarre because in Italy, the mother is really important. So I, I'm shocked and devastated. It's interesting, you know, when people have billions, they still want more. But I guess that's human nature. Okay, sir, now we move on to the max nature of the F1 max factor. Looking at Max's Spanish Rhapsody where he did a grand slam, pole position, fastest lap, and left from start to finish. Here is a look at all-time Grand Slams. Pole position, fastest lap, and of course winning, leading start to finish. Number one, no surprise, Jim Clark with eight Grand Slams. Guess who is second with six? Yeah, it says LCH, which I think stands for Lewis Carl Hamilton. It must be a typo. You mean when he was dominating a lot? Yeah, just like Max is doing right now. Exactly. And apparently now LCH thinks dominating is bad for the fans and everybody is bored and sleeping a lot. Well, that's what he said when Sebastian Vettel was uh, winning. And they all say this. They all sing the same tune. He's got the best score. But you know what, what goes around comes around. Joint third, Alberto Ascari and Michael Schumacher with five each. And at this time, Mighty Max is on three. But he's going to have all the records in Formula 1 if he keeps going. I'm surprised that he's... You know, normally when people get to Formula 1, a lot of them, even before they become successful, they don't want to touch any cars or sports car. But he, Max wants to do other things too. Good for him. And Mario Andretti invited Max to do the Indy 500. Well, that's very good. Well, they have one thing in common. Both series run on the uh, same GP2 engine. Mm, gracias. Yes, that'll be great. Can you imagine if Max does Indy 500 or even one Indy car race? Well, how much crowd that will. And that's what Formula One should really do. Like, you know, put Jensen Butt in one of the races and just invite. Do you remember the euphoria at Laguna? I'll never forget when I went to Laguna Seca because I went there for years and years when Nigel Mansell came. Wow. It gave a legitimacy. Nigel is interested. It's got to be good. It's awesome. I, I mean, and when Fernando... Did the 500. I mean, it was exciting. They're, they're still showing pictures of Fernando in the 500. No, I agree. And not only that, but I think Jensen Button, after his experience in Le Mans, has went out and said, Lewis, Max, you need to leave F1 to do great things as a driver. And they could be right. And Max has already indicated he wants to do Le Mans. Leclerc has already indicated that he wants to do Le Mans. Wouldn't it be fascinating? All of a sudden, we have Le Mans, Max, and Leclerc against each other. There's excitement up ahead, Nasser. Oh, yeah. That'd be laughs, especially if somebody else won. Uh, yeah, no kidding. Okay, sir. Are we ready for uh, interview numero dos? Yes, this is my favorite. Nanini. Yes, uh, this uh, interesting uh, chap, his name is Matteo Nanini, and he won his first race in the U.S. recently, and I will let him explain where. His uncle is uh, one-hit wonder, Alessandro Nanini, who got his first and only win at uh, Suzuka many years ago in a Benetton. Nice young chap. He used to race in Europe. Now he's here, and he's hoping to move up to Indy cars next year. So I thank him for his time and hope our listeners enjoy this chit-chat with Signor Matteo Nanini. Okay, folks, I'm here in Detroit with Signor Matteo Nanini from Italy. Matteo, good to meet you. How are you today? I'm good, thank you. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Now, I was at Indianapolis Motor Speedway a few weeks ago and saw you win the race, which was your first win here in America. Uh, how special was winning your first race at such a historical and important racetrack? It's uh, the home race for the team because the team is based in Indy. 
And it was a good relief because the first races uh, we had to crash in a row, so we needed a good result. We knew the, we had the speed in Indy especially because we had the test uh, before the race. So the weekend was just about putting everything together and no mistakes from my side, from the team side and we were able to collect the, the victory. It was very impressive because in the last few laps there was a lot of pressure on you. Was there ever a moment you thought you might not get the win? Uh, no, I was uh, managing the guy behind with the push to pass so I was not really worried about that. I'm used to that type of pressure when driving so I knew that the most important thing of course was to don't do any mistakes under braking so don't open the door for him. Uh, other than that then we'll just bringing it home. This is your first season in Indy Next. Are you fully adjusted to American style of racing and the car you are driving? Yeah, I think uh, this type of racing uh, I've shown that it's more racing of survival, especially when you don't start uh, at the front of the pack. Of course, my goal is to start every race from, from pole, so to make my life easier. But otherwise, uh, the chance for crashes and contacts are very high, especially in the street races. But uh, yeah, I'm liking it so far. How big of a challenge would be learning over tracks in America? And do you plan to hire a coach uh, to help you with that? Uh, I didn't test yet in the ovals. But I think um, like some drivers, they adapt very quick to the ovals. Some take a little bit longer. So it's just about how I will feel when driving in an actual oval. Okay, you're racing with Honkos Racing before deciding on this team. Did you test with some other teams also? No, I always uh, tested since the first time in this car in 2021 with them. And I always was with them since then. Okay. And who do you see as your biggest rivals for the championship? I think, uh, I mean, everyone can be a competitor, especially because the races are so unpredictable. And uh, with like a little thing, you can really lose a lot of points. Uh, and we are very, very close, all the com competitors. So definitely the HMD boys and Andretti boys are our aim to, to beat. Now what about the level of competition, depth of competition here in America as compared to what you were facing in Europe? I think uh, it's quite different because in Europe we have like a lot of tire degradation which we don't have here. So here you can really push much more and it comes up also on the car that has to be able to last longer to be to be good at f for the whole length of the race. I mean, it's more art racing, but that's also the exciting part of, of this sport. You were born in Faenza, which is home base of Minardi, now Alfa Tori. How old were you when you got the racing bug? I started go-karting at seven. I just kind of liked it. Maybe it was inside of us, because my family background is it was in racing always. And since then, I never really stopped. Now recently there was a lot of flooding in that area, is everything okay now? Yeah, everything is fine. Okay, that's good. In your karting days you raced with Fernando Alonso's team. Did you ever meet the gentleman we call El Machismo? I met Fernando at FIA pre um, celebration when I won the, my Formula 4 championship in 2019 in Paris. And he was there too. I mean all the Formula 1 drivers were there. So yeah, it was just a way to reconnect after many, many years. Is he a cool guy? Yeah, he is. Okay, have you met any other Formula 1 drivers? Uh, yeah, actually, I would say that the most friendly one is the one that looks, that doesn't look friendly, which is Max. So, um, yeah. Okay, now uh, in 2019 you won the UAE Formula 4 Championship with seven wins. What are your best memories uh, from that season? I mean... The, it was my first uh, year in a single seater and the first championship I won so of course it was quite satisfying and it was a kind of a confident, a boost of confidence for the following races I, I was going to approach. Uh, 2020 was a very challenging year for you in Formula 3, scoring points in only two races. Um, how do you look back on that season? Yeah, so it was my first year with Jenser Motorsport. I mean, it took a while for us to find the right pace, but then we were able to score a podium in Barcelona and some other good races which ended like with a contest with other people, so overall it was quite okay. Now, next year, 2021, you moved to HWA, German team from Genzer. Uh, did you feel a big difference between the two teams and how they prepared cars? I mean, in, in F3, there are teams that they always win, 
uh, it's almost written, but uh, we started the championship much stronger also because I had the experience. We almost got the win in the first race in Barcelona, but then we won in Hungary. It was a more up and down season, and we didn't. We started well. We didn't end it that great, and then the team had to close down for for their reason. So that definitely didn't help me. Your victory in Budapest must have been a big relief. Uh, tell us how you won that race. Yeah, so I start was in third place, and they knew that was my best shot to try to win the race. And in Europe, we have a standing start. The start was great. I managed to overtake a car, and then a few laps after, I overtake also the lead. I, I had a big gap of advantage, and just managed that through the through the race. Now, Indy Next is like American version of Formula 2. You did three races in Formula 2. Um, how would you compare these two cars? Uh, Formula 2 has much more horsepower, like 200 more, one, 170 more. Uh, the biggest difference is tire-wise, because in F2 the degradation is very high on the rear tires. Here we don't really have degradation, so uh, we can push more here in the US. It's more physical. Okay. Your uncle Alessandro raced in Formula 1 and I remember his racing career very well. Is he involved in guiding your career? No. I'm just with my dad and uh, I'm doing everything with him and my manager. And where would you like to see your career in five years? Oof, in five years, uh, I don't know, but next year definitely in an IndyCar and then go from there. Okay, great. I thank you for your time. Finally, how about a message to our listeners? You can tell them about your social media website so they can follow your career. Yeah, I'm on all social media platforms with uh, Matteo Nannini, my name. And yeah, you can follow me there, follow the team page, Junko Solinger Racing, and just cheer for us for the rest of the season. I have one more question. Your favorite track in Europe and in America? So, in Europe, I really like in Asia, Baku, Azerbaijan, which is quite similar to this track because it's a very long straight and very slow sections, like in the castle. Uh, in America, so far, I tested only in St. Pete, Barber, Detroit and Indy. So, I would like to see what an oval feels like and then maybe it can be my favorite. Thank you so much. Thank you. All the best. Matteo, thanks for joining F1 weekly.com back to you nas okay sir now we come to motorsports monthly this is a new feature we started last month where we'll talk about some important events uh, from each month june 24 1911 a boy is born in palcars argentina he is named juan manuel fangio same month june 11 1939 jackie stewart is born in scotland June 4, 1950, Bremgarten, Switzerland. The first ever Swiss Grand Prix was round four in the 1950 championship. It took place on a street circuit in a town called Bremgarten. The race was won by Alfa Romeo of Nino Farina, who would go on to become the first Formula One world champion at the end of the season. June 17, 1962, Spa-Francorchamps, Belgium. First ever Grand Prix win in a very impressive style, no surprise there, for Jim Clark of Scotland driving a Lotus. Then that was of course the only team he ever drove for in Formula 1, Formula 2 and British touring cars also. You know he raced a Lotus Cortina at Laguna Seca many moons ago. Correct. White and green. Classic. June 18, 1967. Again at Spa. Dan Gurney's eagle flies in the Arden Forest. Plus he wins Le Mans same month with Supertex AJ Foyt. June 13, 1982. Montreal, Canada. Unlucky day for young Italian racer Riccardo Paletti. In what I think was his only second Formula 1 start, he crashed into the store Ferrari of pole sitter Didier Peroni at the start and lost his life. Uh, the sad scene is available on YouTube if anybody is interested. June 19, 2005. A day that will live in infamy. Clark Rogers and I are deeply honored to be in attendance at one of the most historical Formula One events of all time, the six, the six car United States Grand Prix. Merci to Michelin and thanks to the politics of Formula One. Mr. Rogers, what do you remember most from that day? Well, to be honest with you, it was a very interesting day and we were serious, serious race people and we had the headset and we were listening to the Speed Channel feed. And when you get to that feed, you actually hear everything 
the whole entire production of the Speed Channel show. Very intriguing. And the buzz, they were already talking about it being, well, let's put it this way, only Bridgestone is going to drive, but about an hour before it was actually announced. It was very interesting. I knew ahead of time, just having those headphones, what was going on, but I wasn't disappointed. I thought, to be honest with you, I blamed everything on Ralph Schumacher for running low-pressure tires. Interesting. June 10, 2001. The 2001 Canadian Grand Prix run on this day was a milestone event for Formula One as it marked the very first time in the sports history that two brothers finished first and second in a round of the World Championship. And this is, you were dissing Ralph Schumacher, this is called Karma. This race was won by Ralph Schumacher and his brother Michael was second. So that brings us to famous last words. Today they come from Grand Prix winner, nice guy, commentator, Mr. David Coulthard. He said, and I quote, Racing drivers have balls. Unfortunately, none of them are crystal. End quote. And sir, you are quite the authority on TF. Do you agree with DC? Hi, I'm David Coulthard, uh, otherwise known as DC, and you're listening to F1 Weekly. I do agree with TC. Be careful. You don't want them to be fragile. So he is correct. No crystal balls here but I have no idea what he's babbling about anyway. To be honest with you, I think David is still stuck behind the Truly train. And the Bernoulli train in Monaco. Anyway. Okay, sir, uh, we come to Musical Mondial to close this thing, and unfortunately we lost another famous star of the world of music, Miss Estru Gilberto. Here she is. This is our remembrance for, I would say, her biggest hit. Thank you for listening. Please enjoy. Thank you.